tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The darkness has found you. Welcome to Season 4, Episode 12. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and I'm thrilled you could join me tonight. Tonight, I shan't bore you with tired quips. The time for japes has passed. A story have we, and complete it we must. If you haven't listened to last week's episode, All Trunked Up Part 1, I direct you thusly, as in its absence you will be likened to a lost babe in the woods. Ears stopper to witticism's most cutting. Shall we? You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Thank you for your support. Now, allow me to escort you to a place where the sun dies and nightmares come to life. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. You haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. And now, without further ado, from author Kevin David Anderson, I give you Serendipity, Part Two. The smell of rich cedar in the sauna brought Dale back to when he was a boy, no more than twelve, hunting in the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee with just a bolt action twenty-two and a terrible tracking hound named Buck for company. That dog couldn't find a dead skunk if he'd been standing on it, but there never was a finer friend, or more loyal. Not till Earl, anyway. For the moment, Dale had forgotten the horrors of last week, and just about everything else that was itching him in hard-to-reach places. His muscles and joints were feeling the kind of relaxation only a bottle of top-shelf whiskey could bring. He had the urge to tell Earl right then and there what a great idea this was. But heaping praise and gratitude upon one another wasn't really the cornerstone of their relationship. Besides, Earl was breathing kind of funny. You all right? Dale said. You sound like Peterbilt going uphill. Leave my... Earl took a deep breath. Truck alone. Oh, Jesus... It's hotter than two rats fucking in a wool sock in here. Dale ran a towel over his head. Why don't you step out? Ain't no shame in it. I'm no candy ass. I can hang as long as you can, Earl said. Um, how long are we gonna be in here? Like a half hour? Dale smiled. Oh, about ten minutes. Oh, Jesus, I'm gonna die. Just step out, old man, Dale said. I'll catch up with you. Fine, Earl said, slowly getting to his feet. He wobbled a bit, a mountain off balance. 
and braced himself on the wall. I'll be right outside. As Earl moved the door, it opened abruptly. The security man, Cuball, stuck his hairless head inside. Dale felt his black eyes looking them over. He also felt his calm with her. Uh, excuse me, Earl said, hoisting up his towel. Cuball stood in the doorway, blocking Earl's exit. Earl looked back at Dale with a shrug, then back at Cuball. The security man slowly stepped from the doorway to let Earl pass. The pace at which he did this sent the very clear message. I'm getting out of the way because I want to, not because you want me to. Jesus, Dale thought, gazing upward. Just one asshole free day. Is that too much to ask? After Earl stepped down, Cuball reappeared. How about you? How about me what? Dale said. You gonna be much longer? I'll be as long as I need to be, Dale said, stretching back onto the hot strips of cedar. Cuball's eyes narrowed. Maybe there is some other activity you could try now. Dale had to go fuck yourself, and the blind, deaf, dumb mule you rode in on, all loaded in the chamber and ready to fire. But before he did, the senator stepped into the sauna. That's all right, he said, putting a hand on Cuball's shoulder. He stepped inside and took a seat. Dale expected him to remove his robe, but it remained on as he leaned back onto a cedar bench. Dale hadn't spent a whole lot of time in saunas. Occasionally steam room, but he was pretty sure that wearing a robe inside was... odd. He did feel the need to inquire, but that would break the unwritten rule most men followed. No eye contact or meaningless chit-chat with strangers in elevators public restrooms, and any other place other males were in various stages of undress. Instead, Dale leaned back and breathed in the warm, wet air, trying to relax, or at least look relaxed in the presence of someone he'd much rather put through a window. Sweat trickled down his face, and he kept his eyes shut. Silent minutes passed, and without Earl's constant talking and belabored breathing, his mind started to wander. It didn't take long for it to wander to a church basement a few miles outside of Shreveport, and the images, never far from Dale's memory, begin to rotate like a slideshow. Two kids, a boy and a girl, dirty blonde hair, clawing their way up a basement wall, dried blood under their nails. They hissed through tiny fangs just big enough to see in their young mouths. He swung his weapon, cutting true. Cutting. Dale's eyes opened and he sat up fast. Sweat stung the corners of his eyes and he breathed in. The hot air didn't feel good anymore. He glanced over at the senator, who merely raised an eyebrow. Dale wiped the sweat from his head and tossed the towel on the bench. He sensed it landed kind of funny, and he turned to look to make sure he hit the bench. A chill moved over him. The towel had landed across the toes of a child. Its feet were dirty and bare, standing on the very bench he was sitting. Dale turned slowly, looking up. A child, skin gaunt, clothes threadbare, peered down. Dried blood covered the lower half of its face, and as its lips parted, small ivory fangs emerged. Hot enough for you? Kavanaugh said. His voice made Dale jump, as he had forgotten the man was even there. He turned to the senator, whose lipless grin looked like two dead worms smashed together. You don't look so good, Kavanaugh said. Dale turned back to where the child stood, but now found his towel laying on the bench, touching only hot cedar. He reached over, grabbed it, and wiped his face. Jesus, I'm losing my goddamn mind. In the past few days, his nightmares had become daymares. 
Images flashing in his mind almost every time he closed his eyes. Now, it seemed he no longer needed to shut his eyes. The ghosts from last week were just going to materialize whenever they goddamn pleased. Dale stood and stepped to the exit. He pulled the door open and paused in the doorway, glancing back. The dead, fanged child was back, sitting next to Kavanaugh. The grains in the cedar were just visible through its translucent form, now leaning its head on Kavanaugh. At the senator's feet was another child, maybe female, it was hard to tell. It curled into a ball, knees to chest. The clothes were torn to shreds, head nearly bald, save for several hellish strands, twisted and greasy. Burnt scalp peeled away from bone, some of it touching Kavanaugh's toes. The man, still in his robe, didn't seem to notice. Can you shut the door? Kavanaugh said. You are letting all the darkness out. What? Dale said. The heat, Kavanaugh repeated, pointing at the door. You are letting all the heat out. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> Sorry. Dale stumbled back and let go of the door, letting it shut slowly. Fuck me, he mouthed softly. Earl, extra large robes cinched up, stood by a water cooler, holding a full glass. Hey, Dale, look here, he said. They got water with pieces of fruit in it. I don't know if it's on purpose, but it sure do taste. Dale turned to face Earl. Was wrong, Earl said, taking a step toward Dale. You all look like Spider's ghost just crawled up your ass. Dale wanted very much to come clean and say... I'm seeing things, and now hearing things, and, oh yeah, the remnants of the 13 vampire kids I chopped up and set on fire might have followed me back from Louisiana. Either that, or I'm nuttier than a porta potty at a peanut festival. Dale wiped his face with the towel, and suddenly remembered what it had been touching a few moments ago, and tossed it to the floor. Hey, there's a towel been right there, Earl pointed. Just cause you are a redneck don't mean you got to act like one. Dale grabbed his robe off a hook. You, um, uh, you see anything odd since we've been here? He tightened up his robe and walked past Earl. Um, how odd? Earl said. Like a chicken soup sandwich odd or you and me at a day spa odd? Dale grimaced. Let's just get this done, he said, moving past Earl. Earl stepped in line behind him. That is not a very relaxing mindset you got there. When they got back to the room, they laid face down on the tables and waited for Willow to start the next phase of their day spa treatments. Earl had left the door open, and Dale had a nice view into the hall as Kavanaugh passed by, heading back to his room, robe cinched up to the neck. And right behind him, weighing down the man's shadow were the two children from the sauna. The clarity of the forms didn't fill out as before, but Dale's recall filled in the missing details and the dark, child-sized silhouettes. Why is this happening? Dale had been haunted before, but not like this. Not so vividly. Is it usual for a state congressman, or what did you call him? Earl said, pulling Dale from his thoughts. What? Kavanaugh, what'd you say he was? Um, minority senate leader. Yeah, one of them. Is it normal for one of them to have one, two, three, four bodyguards? They all had wondered that too, but with the images of dead kids using his head as their own personal amusement park, he hadn't put very much thought into it. Can't say, Dale said. Maybe... What happened to his family created some justifiable paranoia. Yeah, I guess a loss like that can do things to you. There was a knock at the door, and without waiting for a response, Willow stepped in. Are we all ready? Ready as I'm gonna get, Dale said. Willow stepped over to Earl's table first, and Dale tilted his head to watch. 
She removed a towel from a medium-sized tray, revealing a pile of glistening stones piled inside a granite bowl. Using a pair of tongs, Willow retrieved a rock from the bowl and began placing them on Earl's back. Every time a stone touched Earl's skin, he made a yummy sound, like the one he makes when he's biting into a chili dog. I'm happier than a dead pig in the sunshine. Dale, you're gonna love this. Dale remained skeptical. Before Willow placed the final rock on Earl, he asked her a question. You're not from here, are you? She paused and stiffened, and her voice became measured. Yes, I am. I live just over the hill in Encino. Yeah, but that's not where your parents and kin are, Earl said. Don't put the girl on the spot, Dale said, having suspected the same thing. I'm guessing Alabama, Earl said. Willow slumped. Close, Smyrna, Georgia. Please don't tell nobody. Well, your sacred safe with us, Earl said. Thank you, she said, her voice sounding natural. First month out here, I couldn't get a job to save my life. You interview with a southern accent and everyone thinks you're stupid and raised in a trailer park. As Earl and Willow continued chit-chatting, Dale heard voices through the wall, slightly raised, but nothing alarming. Sounded like Kavanaugh was living up to Arab's assessment. When there was a break in the conversation, which revolved around Willow trying to follow in Julia Roberts' Hollywood footsteps, also from Smyrna, Georgia, Earl asked, So, does the big shot senator always travel with bodyguards? Willow stepped over to Dale and placed a warm stone on his shoulder blade. I don't know about everywhere, but he's always had him when he comes here. Must be scared of you then, Dale said. Willow laughed. I suspect not. She placed another stone, and then another. The hot rock seemed to melt into Dale's spine. They absorbed his tension like a sponge. Warmth moved down his length, a soothing, tropical wave. Parts of his body he didn't even know he'd clenched were unclenching. He felt calm calmer than he'd been in years. And it was, well, unsettling. So, how long have you two been together? Willow asked. Dale groaned. Earl laughed, then said, Oh, I don't know. How long would you say it's been, Buttercup? We are not together, Dale said, his calm audibly dissipating. There's no judgment here at Serendipity. Earl chuckled enough that a few of his rocks fell out of place. No, he said. Me and Grumpaluffagus over there are not a couple. We're here to work on his blood pressure and a few other of his irritable qualities. Dale felt Willow's hand on his back as she placed the last rock. That is one nice friend you got there. Dale tried not to smile. Yeah, he's a real peach. Now I need to visit some of our other guests. She gestured to a small stereo. Would you like to listen to some music? Got any Johnny Cash? Earl said. Willow smiled big, showing teeth. Back at my apartment. But here we have like Yanni, John Tesh, Enya. Honestly, I'd rather listen to fingernails than a chalkboard. Silence will be fine, Dale said. Good choice. Back in a bit. Willow stepped out closing the door behind her. Earl didn't allow any silence. So, like I started to say, Earl began, there's something I've been meaning to ask you for a while now. Dale took a deep breath and tried not to let Earl's voice disturb his calm. What? Well, we've been riding the same roads for a while now, and been off and on business associates to our mutual benefit. Wouldn't you agree? Are you referring to the trucking or the extracurriculars? Well, both. Trucking mostly. The hell beast wrestling is just plain fun. There was a thud next door, as if something had been knocked to the floor. A woman's voice, barely audible, sounded. I will. Again. Stop. Dale could detect irritation in the woman's voice, but not panic. From what he could tell, she was handling her business best she could. 
in a difficult situation. So, what I want to ask you is, Earl said, how about we make our partnership a little more official? Just because it's legal now doesn't mean I'm going to marry you, sweetie. I was under the impression you didn't like jokes of that nature about our relationship. No, I just don't like it when you do it. Okay, you jackass, Earl said. Shares now. I want you to formalize this partnership, create a company, Earl and Dale Trucking, or E and D Trucking. What's wrong with Dale and Earl Trucking? Well, I was just thinking it should be alphabetical. You idiot. That is, something hit the wall. Hard. Dale imagined one of the rolling carts sliding across the floor and smashing into a wall. There were now several women yelling. I don't care who you are, you keep your hands to yourself. Dale's calm was departing like Baptists leaving service on Super Bowl Sunday. I am designed a logo. Earl reached around for his pocket, but slapped nothing but towel. And when I get near my britches, I'll show you. I'll think it's a fine idea, Nail said, and I will give it some thought under one condition. Which is, that if you tell the story of when you asked me to go into business with you, you say we were in a proper bar, had a pitcher of beer, shots of whiskey, and watched football. Okay, Earl said. Who's playing? Um, LSU and Ole Miss, and it went into overtime. Earl chuckled. <laughs> Fine. You'll think on it? I said I would. The door slammed so hard it shook the walls, and Dale distinctly heard crying. A woman crying. Shit. Dale rolled over and sat up, the rock sliding off his back. You hearing this? Earl sighed. Yeah. He swiveled his head to look at Dale. You're gonna go over there and cause a ruckus, ain't you? Dale reached for his pants. Huh, you can tell? You've got your ruckus face on. I knows all your faces. Dale stepped into his pants. That is both sweet and unsettling. Earl sat up, rocks hitting the floor. Okay, before you go and destroy a perfectly good day spa, can I just ask you to consider that maybe this place can handle its business? They don't need a big redneck smashing up the joint to help some ladies. That, in this day and age, probably won't appreciate our kind help anyhow. A shout came from the other side of the wall, and Dale definitely heard the word, No! It sounded like Willow. Think that's our young Peach getting squeezed. Well, she is a Johnny Cash fan from Georgia. The senator might have bit off more than he can chew, Earl said. Dale gave his friend a hard stare. Earl, what if that was one of your nieces over there? Earl threw his head back. Oh, God damn it. What did you have to go and say that for? Now I got you to go over there and cause a ruckus too. Shit. Dale felt the thrill of blood boiling tension. It coursed through him like cocaine through an adrenaline junkie. Get your pants on, old man. It took near 90 seconds for Earl to get dressed, save for one sock. Holding his unworn sock open, he bent down and scooped up five of the stones and placed them inside. He then tied a knot, sealing up the open end. Dale had retrieved a stone as well. He cradled it in his right hand. A little thick for skipping, but it felt warm and soothing. On any given day, Dale's fist could feel like a brick to the face. But with a large stone nestled under his fingers, it would feel like a sledgehammer to the skull. Earl met Dale at the door. He glanced back at the serene little room they were leaving and sighed. Oh, I really did hope this would be good for you, Dale. I know you did, buddy. Dale met his friend's gaze. And I do appreciate it. Really, I do. Now, let's go hit something. A shrill scream boomed from the hallway. Dale pulled the door open. Willow, her shirt torn, stepped from the room next door and dashed down the hall. Scanning the scene, he noticed that Pornstash stood behind them in the little waiting room at the stairs in the rear guard position. His gaze cast down the staircase. The one Earl called Blockhead stood outside Cavanaugh's door about six feet away. 
no sign of Cuball and Beanstalk, and Dale surmised that they were inside with the honorable statesman. You go deal with Pornstash, Dale said. Then, you come catch up with me. Roger, Dodger. Earl stepped into the hall and moved toward the small waiting area. Dale lingered to see how well Earl handled Mr. Numchunks, but he felt Blockhead's eyes on him, so he turned to face him. Dale used his body to obstruct Blockhead's view into the waiting area, and the two men just eyed one another. Behind Dale, sounds of scuffle began, the details of which were loud enough to vaguely describe what was happening. A man grunted. A weapon whipped fast through the air, striking flesh. Dale winced a little, thinking he probably should have mentioned the numchucks to Earl. A good friend surely would have. There was another, deeper groan than the sound of someone smashing through a piece of furniture. This got Blockhead's notice, and Dale smiled wide, trying to keep the big man in his place. Dale could see the debate in his eyes. Should he help his co-worker, or should he maintain his post? Dale chose to make the decision for him. As nonchalantly as the 250-pound redneck in an upscale day spa could, Dale strolled toward the security man outside Kavanaugh's door. Blockhead narrowed his gaze, understanding Dale's intention. When close enough, he placed a hand on Dale's shoulder. Why don't you just mind your own business? Dale smiled wider than he knew how, even showed some teeth. Blockhead had already made two mistakes. The first, putting a hand on Dale. The second, and only slightly more important mistake, had to do with how the man had his weapon holstered, grip laying across his chest. It was clear that the hand on Dale's shoulder was the one he used to draw his weapon. Big mistake. This episode of Horror Hill is proudly brought to you by HelloFresh. Some of you may not know this about me, but I'm actually something of a recovering garbage belly. Yeah, I had to break some pretty unhealthy eating habits. As a kid, I had an issue with Sprite addiction. Now you heard right. Sprite. That sticky, lemon-limey sugar water that basically came out of the faucets in the 90s. Soon as no one was looking, I'd grab one of those big two-liter jobs and just chug it. Chug it until either I vomited or I felt very ill. Yep, it was kind of like playing Russian roulette with diabetes and tooth decay. From there, I slowly worked my way up to the calamari wars, that is double orders of fried calamari. Wasn't all my fault, back then we still thought carbs were good. As one would expect, my appetites followed me all the way to freshman year of college where my weekly study sessions quickly devolved into me consuming an entire pizza to myself, all the while smoking an entire pack of cigarettes and washing it all down with an entire 12-pack of Coors Light. Now, I know what you're thinking. Did he just say Coors Light? Ugh. Well, just simmer down, kids. We didn't have as many options back then. And also, kids, while we're talking here, don't smoke cigarettes. And don't drink Coors Light, though you don't need me to tell you that, you've got your parents for that. Alright, moving on. Well, as you can probably guess, it was only a matter of time before fate intervened, and an unpleasant GI condition precluded me from all the things I liked, like southwestern egg rolls, or Korean tacos, or, um, Jamaican jerk pizza, what have you. I'll say I did lose weight quickly after that. Although the side effects of all that Coors Light did do a number on my skin's elasticity. Now it all just hangs there. Like fleshy pajamas. Sallow and jaundiced. Like some wrinkly, earthbound sugar glider. Just waiting for that right gust of wind. It was time to turn my life around. What I needed was some kind of meal service. Something that would help cut out the stressfulness of meal planning and grocery store trips, keep me away from the takeout, you know? Something I could generally whip together in 30 minutes or less. Something with high quality fresh ingredients sourced directly from growers and delivered from the farm right to my front door in under a week. Contact free, of course. 
with everything individually apportioned. Because let's face it, measuring stuff, it's not for me. That's when I discovered HelloFresh. Oh yeah. Hello Fresh. Damn! Talk about variety. HelloFresh offers 50 menu and market items each week, including ready-to-eat salads, sandwiches, and soups. And after they partnered with Green Chef, that's even more variety. HelloFresh is 28% cheaper than shopping at your local grocery store. It is 72% cheaper than a restaurant meal, and no quality is sacrificed. Touch particular, are you? Well, HelloFresh offers the flexibility you need to easily customize your order on the app within minutes. Easily change your delivery day. This is delivered, by the way, if I didn't mention it. Yep, they bring you all the ingredients. You bring it in your kitchen, you cook it, eat it, it's good. Food preferences. Plan size. Or you can just skip a week whenever you need. It has changed my life. Those buffalo spiced crispy chicken cutlets. Mwah. Yum. And it really impressed my date that night, too. I don't know if this is too much information, but uh, I got lucky. With HelloFresh. And you can, too. All he got to do is go to HelloFresh.com slash 14Hill and use code 14Hill for up to 14 free meals plus free shipping. Pretty good deal, right? Yep, yep. Here it is again. Go to HelloFresh.com slash 14Hill and use code 14Hill for up to 14 meals plus free shipping. It's America's number one meal kit, baby. Now, bandwagons aren't usually my thing, but this one? I think you should jump on it. Thank you for your support of this program and at the sponsors that make it possible. Normally, as a matter of honor and respect for his opponent, Dale waited until his adversary made the first aggressive move. But any man who would stand by as another man mistreated a lady had no honor and certainly didn't deserve Dale's respect. As quick as lightning to a rod, Dale's arm shot upward and wrapped up the man's outstretched limb. Dale locked the man's elbow and held his wrist inside his armpit. In a simultaneous action, Dale brought up his right fist, cradling a warm stone. Connecting under the jaw, the man's head snapped back like a Pez dispenser. Dale pulled Blockhead toward him as he followed through with his blow, trying to avoid the back of the man's head hitting the door. No need to alert Q-Ball and Beanstalk about what was happening in the hall. As Dale pulled him away from the door, still holding his gun hand tightly, he noticed the other hand making an attempt at his sidearm. With Blockhead's oversized physique, the effort was awkward and clearly not going to work, like a fat man trying to wash his back. But Dale admired the man's diehard spirit. To their right was a shelf hook about waist high in the wall, displaying a tiny Keebler elf sized Zen garden. It was beautiful and serene, and Dale smashed the man's head right into it. Blockhead's mouth hit the edge of the nook with a horrific crack. As the man slid against the wall, legs folding back, Dale noticed several teeth laying on the tiny shelf. He picked up the marble-sized molars and looked at the tiny Zen garden, now slightly askew. He straightened it, then took a moment to carefully place the teeth in the sand, making sure to arrange them in a manner that complemented the natural flow of the peaceful pattern. He stepped back, and admired his work, feeling very, very zen. Dale bent over the body, part of which was propped up by the wall, making it look like he still had some fight in him. He checked the man's pulse, found it, then pushed the rest of him onto the floor. Retrieving the man's sidearm, Dale removed the ammo and dropped it and the clip in a vase. When he turned back around, Earl was heading his way. In the distance, Dale could see a pair of legs sprawled out on the ground behind him. Earl wiped his lip, smearing blood on his chin. Did he get one in? Dale said. Sure as hell did. Dang fool with nunchucks. Who the hell carries nunchucks? The world ain't a kung fu movie. You shouldn't be so critical, Dale said. You brought sock filled with rocks. 
Earl smiled, then slapped the weapon he'd learned to make as a kid into his hand. A stone that apparently had been working its way through a hole during the fight slipped out and tumbled to the floor. I am. I need no socks. Nail chuckled. That's about as hillbilly as it gets. Gentlemen, please, Arab said, coming down the hall. Please stop. Dale moved past Arab, heading for Kavanaugh's door. Well, we just want to have a conversation with the man. Express our opinion on how one should treat a lady. Then we'll get out of your hair. Arab gestured at the bodies on the floor. Like you did with... with them? Well, they were rude, Dale said. Earl wiped his lip. Awful rude. Arab opened his mouth to protest, but a blood-curdling scream boomed from inside the room. Earl looked at Arab. What do you say, Herb? Arab looked flustered, then nodded. Okay. Kick his ass. Dale pushed the door wide open. He only had a split second to take in the room. Twice the size of the one he'd been in, it had a tinted window, large enough to put a piano through, facing the street. Cuball stood on the far side of the room, close to the window. His right hand held the wrist of a staff member, her shirt violently untucked, and a palpable look of terror on her face. Cavanaugh, wearing only a towel, secured her other wrist, and in his free hand, held a small blade. But it wasn't the dainty knife that struck Dale like a hammer. It was the burned brand mark in the center of Kavanaugh's chest that gave Dale a near-fatal, momentary pause. Beanstalk, a good foot and a half taller than Dale, came at him from the side. Dale saw the muzzle of the Colt close-quarter battle pistol moving toward his head. Dale hunkered low and moved into Beanstalk. Due to the man's stature, it didn't take much effort to come underneath it. Dale grasped his gun hand and redirected the muzzle toward the ceiling just as he fired. The bullet disappeared into the ceiling. Dale wanted to relieve the man of the pistol before he got off another shot, but Beanstalk's grip was ironclad. Using both hands, Dale forced the pistol down and toward the window. While punching Dale in the gut, Beanstalk fired two more times, sending both shots through the glass. The window didn't shatter but a white web of cracks spun from the center outward. When the first shot rang out, Kavanaugh released the staff member, as did Cuball. She ran, screaming from the room, and Kavanaugh tried to follow. He dropped his blade onto the massage table and tucked in behind her. Earl moved into his path, and the frail, near-naked man bounced off Earl's belly, landing under the cracked window. And that's when Dale saw them again. The kids, or remnants of the kids, were in the room as well. They stayed close to Kavanaugh, who didn't seem to notice. As the wheel started to turn in his head, Beanstalk's fist connected with Dale's chest. Even wincing in pain, an image from last week flashed in his mind. The faces of the two kids were screaming at him, fangs bared, as Dale removed their heads. Why the hell were they haunting him here? And why just the two of them? He'd put down a dozen of the creatures in that church basement. Trying to put the pieces together while fighting with a gun-wielding giant was not yielding the desired results. His chest ached, and his back muscles felt as if they were fighting uphill. Dale decided to focus on the physical. He drove the pistol back into the man's lean gut, and if he had a mind to pull the trigger, he'd shoot himself in the stomach. The realization flashed over Beanstalk's face, and Dale took his momentary indecision to pry two of his fingers from the grip. With an upward twist, Dale snapped them like twigs. Beanstalk dropped the gun and took another swing at Dale's gut, but missed. Dale wanted to follow up the finger snapping with a headbutt, but he'd need stilts for that. He kicked the pistol under the massage table as Beanstalk went into his jacket with his good hand. Dale figured it was a knife and probably in no way dainty like the one Kavanaugh brought. Dale reached back onto the massage table, grasping the little blade that Kavanaugh had been only moments away from abusing a staff member with. As his finger grasped the handle, he caught sight of Earl, rock in hand, 
releasing a well-wound-up pitch. The rock hit Cuball's forehead so hard that he dropped like a battleship anchor. Cuball in the corner pocket, Earl called out. Beanstalk fumbled in his jacket, making it obvious that the hand he used wasn't his good hand. This gave Nail a second to reach back further and get a hold of Kavanaugh's abandoned weapon. As his fingers enveloped the handle, he knew immediately that something was wrong. Dale held the object in front of his face. Oh shit. Not a knife. Not a dainty knife. Not any kind of knife. Cavanaugh had brought a chrome dildo, fashioned to look like a knife. Jesus. What a sleazeball. Dale turned back to Beanstalk just in time to see that the NBA-sized bodyguard had not brought a dildo, but a K-Bar Marine issue 7-inch straight-edge blade. It didn't take a weapons expert to conclude that in a knife fight, a K-Bar beats a dildo every goddamn time. He raised his forearm to fend off the attack from up on high. The blade cut deep into the underside of his arm, and Dale felt it hit the bone. Not waiting for Beanstalk to open up his arm with a twist or a downward slash, Dale bulldozed forward and seized the form of Beanstalk's knife hand. Holding it firm, he pushed him back against the wall and lashed out with the only weapon in his hand. He thrusted the dildo like a blade into the man's open mouth. Beanstalk made gargled choking sounds as Dale pushed it forward. At some point, a button had been depressed and a soft hum floated up from the tiny device as it started to vibrate. Dale thrust a knee upward, hard. Unfortunately, his target was too high, and he missed by a foot. Feeling the K-bar scraping his ulna, Dale decided it was time to phone a friend. Earl! Cuball was trying to get up. Earl kicked him hard in the face, then yelled over his shoulder, What? Can you give me a hand with Slender Man here? Earl turned around. Who? Earl! Earl took two quick steps toward Beanstalk and swung the sock at his outside knee. There was a sickening crack, and Beanstalk shrieked in pain, then started to fall. Timber! Earl cried. For good measure, Dale smashed him in the face as he fell. The tree of a man hit the floor hard, his branches spreading out like scattered driftwood. Hey, Earl said. Don't go doing that. What? Changing nicknames in the middle of a fight, Earl said. It's confusion. I'm sorry. Dale grabbed the vibrating dildo out of Beanstalk's throat. He didn't want the man to choke while unconscious. Good or bad, no man wants their mama to know that's how they went out. Choked to death by a novelty dildo. Kavanaugh suddenly got to his feet and dashed for the door. Earl reached across the table and grabbed what remained of his hair and yanked him back. He called out in pain as Earl pulled him over the table. He fell over the other side but remained on his feet. The two revenants moved toward Kavanaugh, the girl sitting down by his ankles. They both looked up at Dale, eyes trying to deliver a message. One he finally received. Oh shit, Dale said. I'm so stupid. Earl looked confused. Not there to disagree, but why are you stupid? They're not haunting me. Dale threw the dildo at Kavanaugh's chest. They're haunting this pile of shit. Dale spun on his boot heel in frustration, then reached for a hand towel. He wrapped it around his wounded forearm. Surprisingly, there wasn't much blood, and Dale knew that was a good sign. He bent down and scooped up the K-bar from Beanstalk's unconscious grip. Not at all sure what my friend is talking about, Earl said, turning on Kavanaugh. But I'd like to talk to you about how to treat a lady. No means no, asshole. Well, you got no family learning. Forget that, Dale said, pushing Kavanaugh up against the massage table. He took the K-bar and put the tip into the brand on his chest. I want to know about this and where they are. Kavanaugh looked perplexed. You... you know what this mark means? He looked Dale up and down, and even in his less than advantageous position, managed to sound superior. You? 
I know all about that ancient glory hole of fangs, Nail said. Kavanaugh's brow hardened. <laughs> then you know how fucked you are. Not as fucked as you. If you don't start talking, Dale pushed the knife in. Kavanaugh squealed, and a thin stream of blood fell from his chest. Whoa. Earl clasped his hand on Dale's knife hand, pulling the blade away from Kavanaugh's flesh. Look, we came to protect the ladies and teach them Cretans what happens when you disrespect a woman. Now, I think they've... Dale wrenched his hand free. It ain't about that no more. Well, enlighten me. Kavanaugh chortled like a schoolgirl with a secret. Dale thrust the knife down, stabbing the massage table, missing Kavanaugh by an inch. He then jabbed his index finger at the now bloodied brand. See that? Earl eyed the mark, burned deep into Kavanaugh's chest. About the size of a silver dollar, the details on its lower half were obscured by crimson, but above, the etching was clear. The top of an Egyptian ankh rising up from something. It's not to my taste, Earl said. But what's it mean? It's the flesh talisman. It means he's loyal to them. And they are loyal to me, Kavanaugh added. Loyal to who? Earl said. An ancient coterie of bloodsuckers that's known for cultivating powerful humans. Dale scowled at Kavanaugh. Or humans seeking power. Uh, ancient Kodal, what? Earl muttered. I never heard of them. It's old news, Dale said. Men Franklin and the other founding fathers chased them all the way back to Europe. Last eyes on them had them hunkered down in hidey holes throughout Mesopotamia. Earl muttered. Um, Mesopotamia? Where? Kavanaugh's sick, worm-like grin returned. Oh, you have no idea what is coming. Dale actually had a pretty good idea, but Earl wasn't grasping the situation. He hadn't had the benefit of Dale's training, the disillusionment of knowing and seeing way too much. Dale needed his friend to catch up, or at least get a taste of what they were dealing with. You know how a human can earn this mark, Dale said, pointing at the flesh talisman. Earl shrugged. It's earned by showing their undying loyalty and commitment. A human wanting this mark makes an offering, Dale said. An offering of children. Earl's face turned pale, his features dropped like stones, and those aspiring to demonstrate their unbound devotion, attaining the highest level of allegiance, they offer their own children. He let them feed on his own flesh and blood, Earl said, his voice stunned. Dale glared at Kavanaugh and thumped his chest. They can feed on them. Bleed them for fun, or even sicker. They can turn them. No, Earl mouthed. They don't do that. Oh, yeah. Ask me how I know, Dale said. Because they did turn them. Then, for whatever reason, they dumped them in Louisiana, but they started hunting and turning other kids. Over a dozen by the time I got there. Dale took a step back. There was a preacher, a good man. He thought they were just sick, so he hit them in the church basement, not knowing what they were. The kids fed on their parents and the entire congregation. They turned a little town into hell on earth. Dale thrust a finger at Kavanaugh's face. And it's all because of this mangy piece of demon fuck. Kavanaugh sat up, looking emboldened. Those were my kids to do with what I want. He spit in Dale's face. You had no business interfering. They were stepping stones to my greater glory. It took everything Dale had not to gut the man right then and there, but he knew he was worth more alive than dead. Kavanaugh had been sleeping with the enemy, 
He knew where they were. Dale wiped the saliva from his cheek, then looked over at his friend to see how he was taking it, and immediately knew something was wrong. Earl's pale expression changed to one of pure rage. It was a face he hadn't really seen before. Not like this. Earl? Before Dale could stop him, Earl's right hand slapped across Kavanaugh's throat. Dale reached for Earl's wrist, but his friend was already on the move. Earl lifted the politician off the floor by the neck and screamed, Your own children! He took three fast leaping steps. Earl, no! Earl grunted as he shot put at the man through the window. Broken glass crashed all around, nearly drowning out the sounds of Kavanaugh's screams. The screaming stopped suddenly with a loud thud, followed by a car alarm. Dale stepped over to the window. Kavanaugh had sailed clear over the sidewalk and landed, not at all gently, on a familiar cherry red Mercedes. Earl had been an all-state shot putter in high school, and Dale had always admired the skill he demonstrated when tossing folks. <sighs> Dale said, staring down. Earl backed from the window. Oh, damn. What did I just do? Well, you easily scored a ten for distance, that's for damn sure. Gentlemen, where is the senator? Eric said, standing in the doorway. Earl pointed out the window. Arab sashayed over and peered down. Oh, my, 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 oh my, is he dead? Dale leaned out the window a bit and took a hard look. Nah, he's still breathing. Kavanaugh moaned and tried to sit up on the car roof that now had a massive dent the shape of his ass. He slumped back, beginning to sob. Oh, Jesus, what's wrong with me? Earl muttered, his hand shaking. A small crowd began to gather, including the twenty-something James Spader look-alike, running up from a nearby shop. He yelled something and grabbed handfuls of his own hair in frustration. Now that... That right there, Dale chuckled. That... is some serendipity. <laughs> I don't know what in the hell came over me, Earl said. Still looking out the window, Dale reached back and put a hand on Earl's shoulder. Your heart was in the right place. Don't look like Kavanaugh's leg is, though. That is definitely broke. Jesus, I'm going to jail. Don't fret, Earl. It's not the first time you've tossed an asshole out a window. Well, I know, but that was my first senator. Dale chuckled. Guess you're moving up in the world, confronting a higher class of asshole. Earl turned on Dale. You're making jokes, but I don't think this is funny. This is serious. It is serious, Dale said calmly. But not the kind of serious you're thinking. The law is not what we need to worry about. Well, what then? Dale tried to think of an answer that would be quick and satisfy, but none came. He turned away from the window and his eyes fell on the two remnants of Kavanaugh's children. They stood side by side, no longer in tattered clothes, no more burnt flesh. They looked like they did the day they disappeared. Clean, private school uniforms, freshly washed skin, and immaculately arranged hair, the hallmark of a doting mother. Hey, Dale, Earl said softly. Yep. You, uh, you see two kids standing over there? Yep. The girl put her hand inside her brother's, and they stared up at Dale. He felt their piercing blue eyes, cold and warm at the same time. It seemed for a moment that they might speak, but then they turned, walked from the room, the girl leading the boy as if they were going to school. Were they, uh, who were they? Earl stammered. I mean, um, was that? Yeah, Dale said. I think so. Earl sighed, hands still shaking. Well, I don't mind saying, but my butt just puckered right the hell up. You need beer? Like never before. 
Dale turned to Erb, who still stared down at the carnage. Hi, Erb, um, you got a back exit? Erb turned around slowly, his face pale, stunned. We are not covered for this. Trust me, you'll be compensated, Dale said. Back exit, you got one? Yes, um... Take the emergency stairs to the right. It takes you to the rear parking. Thank you, Air, Dale said, pushing Earl to the door. And hey, you and Earl? You sure were right. Confusion flashed over Air's face. About? Dice bars, Dale said with a smile. They're awful relaxing. I ain't felt this good in a long, long time. Air raised his hand, looking as if he was going to wave goodbye, but it remained static, and seemed as stunned and shell-shocked as the rest of his body. Please? Give us a favorable Yelp review? Three hours, thirteen stitches, and a fistful of antibiotics later, Dale sat at a table in the dark corner of a poorly lit bar. It was the kind of place where Johnny Cash could be heard singing on the jukebox about walking the line over the soft clank of a pool stick tapping the cue ball. The waitresses didn't mind customers looking with their eyes, but if they looked with their hands, they'd find a beer stein cracked against their skull and a shotgun escort from the premises. Small objects, bits of glass, teeth, broke under boots stepping on the floor, discolored in chaotic Rorschach splotches, Stains that were not the products of spilled drinks. To Dale, this was a place of comfort, relaxation, a familiar place, and not a man bun in sight. Carrying a full pitcher and two shots of whiskey, Earl joined Dale at the table. He slid his friend one of the shot glasses. In unison, the men raised their whiskey. Cavern old little ones, Earl said. God rest their souls. Amen. The two men drank and returned the empties to the table. The shot of whiskey was calming, but Dale's head still spun, trying to reckon all the events that had to happen to put him where he found himself today. Earl had to fall for an animal-loving woman named Candy. Candy with a K. She had to drag him to a fundraising silent auction where they won a gift certificate to a particular day spa with a particular expiration date causing Earl to bring Dale instead of Candy. Dale stopped short of wondering about all the events that led to Candy being single, a single mom, and unavailable for a free couple's session at Serendipity. But he did resolve that if he ever met the someone in charge of arranging all these circumstances, they were definitely going to have words. The TV behind the bar ran continuous coverage of the biggest local news story of the day. The TV was muted, but neither of them needed sound to follow the story. They had heard it several times on the radio for the past few hours. State Senator Frederick H. K. Cavanaugh, while undergoing physical therapy at a spa in Brentwood, was seriously injured when he accidentally fell from a second-story window. A spokesman for Cavanaugh said that since the tragic loss of his two children, he had been plagued with chronic dizzy spells. This condition was likely the cause of the accident, which resulted in a broken femur, pelvis, and multiple contusions. Cavanaugh is in serious but stable condition and is expected to make a full recovery. The outpour of well wishes and support have been overwhelming, and Cavanaugh, or the Honorable H.K., as he likes to be called, wanted to credit the skilled and rapid response of the city's emergency services, which... Blah, 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 horse shit. Earl turned away from the TV. Guess you were right. The law ain't interested in us. It's a good thing, too. I'm way too pretty to go to jail. Knowing what we know, Dale said, the last place Kavanaugh wants us is in custody. Earl reached for the pitcher with a shaky hand. I got it, Dale said, and began to pour. You all right? Earl put his hand on his beer mug. I will be. When Dale finished pouring, Earl took a long, deep drink and swallowed slow. I never lost control like that before. It scared the hell out of me. 
He took another drink. It's still scaring me. Dale didn't know how to respond, so he didn't. Earl put his empty mug on the table. Maybe, um, maybe we should head back and try some of that reiki. Dale filled Earl's mug back up. What the hell for? So as they can tune the chakra that will allow my butt to unpucker. Dale took a drink. Well, this ain't the first time you've been violent. I've seen you put down man and beast. So why is it so different? Damn, Dale. You never listen. I'm trying, old man. I wasn't in control. I wasn't behind the wheel. I was nothing but anger and hate. I was like a... <clears throat> well, it was like... It was like I was you for a hot minute. Nail sat back. There's an insult in there somewhere. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Earl took a deep breath. I imagine there's a lot you've got to tell me now. Yeah, Dale said. There is, if you still want to hear it. Earl sat still for a beat, then reached into his back pocket. First things first. Earl tossed down the logo he had sketched for Earl and Dale trucking. It was as round as the Anheuser-Busch cardboard drink coaster he'd sketched it on. Dale picked it up. It was crude, not at all professional. But it did have potential. We still want to partner up. We've been partners for years. It's just time to make it legal. What about your unpuckered butt? You let me worry about that. Nail leaned forward and looked Earl dead in the face. Things are different now. Rules seem to be changing. Maybe there never were any. I don't know. Whatever shred of decency they had, any sense of honor amongst beasts is long gone. And the game's anew. Nail tossed the logo on the table. If you go down this road with me, I can't honestly say where it might lead. He wanted to add, or what you might become, but he kind of felt it was implied. Earl sat back, brought his mug up, put on his serious face, the one he reserved for deep thinking and watching episodes of Jeopardy. After a gulp and a long swallow, Earl's contemplation came to an end. I can't honestly say I know exactly what you're talking about, but I do know one thing. Which is, whatever is down the road, we're better off driving through it together than we are apart. Nell raised his mug. Fair enough. Earl brought his lips up as well. The Earl and Dale trucking. Nell scoffed. I like Dale and Earl trucking. Nope, Earl said. It sounds better alphabetical. Good God, Dale and Earl is a... Tell you what. Why don't we settle this like men? Suits me fine, Earl said. Darts or nine ball? Nine. The two men tossed back their mugs. They drank long, deep, and finished the pitcher before either of them said another word about the future. When Dale sensed the time had come to tell Earl things he needed to know, he ordered another pitcher. It arrived with an inch of froth and a weary smile from the waitress. Dale filled their mugs just as Patsy Klein's voice floated over from the jukebox. Earl sat quietly and listened while Dale spoke. Then Miss Klein sang about the wisdom of walking after midnight. You've been listening to Serendipity Part 2 by author Kevin David Anderson. Once again, if you missed last week's episode, I strongly encourage you to revisit for Part 1 of Kevin David Anderson's Serendipity. Serendipity was written by and presented courtesy of Kevin David Anderson. Anderson's debut novel, The Geeky Cult Zombie Romp, Night of the Living Trekkies, is a funny, offbeat novel exploring the pop culture carnage that ensues when the undead crash a Star Trek convention. His latest book, Midnight Men, The Supernatural Adventures of Earl and Dale, 
Mwah, was inspired by the short story Green Eyes and Chili Dogs, produced by yours truly, Jason Hill. And the original version can be heard on my own YouTube channel and on the Simply Scary Podcast Season 3, Episode 6. Anderson's stories have appeared in over a hundred publications and on fantastic podcasts such as the Drabblecast, Pseudopod, the No Sleep Podcast, Horror Hill, and the Simply Scary Podcast. In addition, he's an active member of the Horror Writers Association and currently works in special education. For more information on him, visit kevindavidanderson.com. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to me. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks, available now on audible.com. If you'd like to hear a premium, ad-free edition of tonight's and all our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive, dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the horror hill for yet another dance with darkness, I bid you good night. Sleep tight, listener, and whatever you do, if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in. You've been listening to Horror Hill, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, as well as a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Jason Hill unless otherwise noted. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors, sound design, original music, and final mixing and mastering provided by Felipe Ojeda under the guidance of executive producer and director Craig Groshek. The program's logo was created by Craig Groshek, and this week's artwork provided by Omega Black, unless otherwise noted. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at horrorhill at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of the show. If you enjoyed what you've heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and Horror Hill on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or request. If you can never get enough spooky stories and can't wait until next week for more, and haven't already, be sure to check out Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for hundreds of free audio horror stories, including more performances from yours truly, 
and consider supporting us by becoming a patron at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next week with more frightening fiction to haunt your dreams. Until next time, I'm Jason Hill, and you've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast. Good evening, and sweet dreams. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. (laughs) 